It is January 8th for the Education and Environment Sustainability Committee meeting. Can I have a roll call, please? Call on the roll, Ms. Simon. Here. Ms. Brown. Here. Mr. Jones. Here. Ms. Stevens. Present. We have a quorum. Also like the record to reflect that Councilman Miller is also in attendance. Thank you so much. We have minutes from November 20th. Can I have a motion to approve these minutes? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Minutes approved. We're going to move forward. Council Chair, we have um, a speaker. Oh, comment. I'm sorry. I skipped over public comment. Ms. Go ahead. Mitch. Fran Mitch. Thank you. Um, I, I thank you all for attending this very important first meeting about East Cleveland and Nela Park. I say first meeting because the future of Nela Park is only part of East Cleveland's future, a future I am very concerned and pessimistic about. As a resident of Cleveland Heights, I am impacted by the city of East Cleveland, uh, and East Cleveland has strong regional effects. East Cleveland has had significant destructive social and economic problems for decades, but the biggest problem that East Cleveland has is its willfulness to stay exactly the way it is. And local and county and state government enable East Cleveland's desire to remain the way it is with all its economic and social problems. When offered not just money, but opportunities to change East Cleveland's condition, East Cleveland government and apparently its citizens reject them. Unfortunately, the social and public health problems are not contained uh, within the city limits. Just one example, East Cleveland City Council sold land for $120,000 to Arco Recycling for one half its assessed value. That business turned that land into a toxic dump that cost the EPA $9.1 million to clean up my question, I hope you can answer this at some point, is was the FBI ever involved? I'm not aware if they were. But again, I thank you for this first meeting and look forward to others in the future and actions that follow. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, the next item on the agenda, well, the first item on the agenda is a contract resolution. Can I have that read, please, Madam Clerk? Resolution number 2019-0295, authorizing an amendment to contract number CE170024 with Child Care Resource Center of Cuyahoga County doing business as starting point for out-of-school time services for youth for the period 1-1-2018 to December 31st, 2019, to extend the time period to December 31st, 2020, and for additional funds in the amount not to exceed $1,645,000. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Happy New Year. You too. Robin Martin, um, Family and Children First Council. This contract is for our out-of-school time services for youth ages kindergarten through graduation. Um, through this contract, we provide services for our youth for um, after-school programming, summer programming, tutoring, educational enrichment, arts and culture exposure, recreation, career exploration, and college readiness. The contract is broken down in several components. Um, there's out-of-school time sites that, that cover 21 consortiums across the city of Cleveland, nine consortiums across inner ring and outer ring suburbs. It covers the cost of a data system to track the young people, the programming that they're receiving, uh, a quality assessment, process for all of the providers, a literacy component, a transition component, and it feels like I'm forgetting something else, but we do a lot of surveys with the kids to make sure that they are um, receiving the greatest benefit possible from this program. Um, the reason we started doing out of school time, actually we started in uh, 2004, but we changed the model in 2008 to be um, a more structured model where we could look at quality and make sure that kids were really getting what they needed from the programming. And the reason we did it is because across the state of Ohio, for our kids 5 to 19, um, what we found out is that our kids are in unsupervised care about 5.6 hours a week, which means there's no parent 
there or an, or, or an adult. And so we wanted to make sure that during that time frame, they are in an activity that is me meeting their social emotional needs, helping them with their academic achievement, but also sometimes some fun, but it's keeping them in a safe environment until parents are able to pick their kids up when they get off work. And so our out-of-school time programs, initially we were primarily serving elementary school kids, but over the last contract, we have been able to expand and actually meet the needs of some of our middle schoolers. Um, because everybody is not involved in after-school sports or after-school sports don't cover the entire school year. So we've been able to do some expansion of the program within the funding that we have trying to reach that slightly older age group. And now it just came to me, the part that I missed. Um, we also provide, um, uh, through work with College Now, we have kindergarten clubs for parents that are having their first kindergarten experience. Um, it's as traumatic for the parent as it is for the kids. So ha having that club where they can go in and see you know, what to expect their first day of kindergarten. Who's your teacher? Where's the bathroom? Those types of components of kindergarten. The literacy component is for our school age kids to look at the third grade reading guarantee. But then on the high school end, we're also looking at preparation for ACTs. And you would be surprised, but we also have to do boot camps for parents for FAFSA forms because they're not easy to fill out. Um, so we provide, there are a lot of services in this contract. There's also a um, part of the literacy, literacy component. There is a program that does, um, it's a film. The outcome of it is a film. And so the young people, it's a two-year process. They write a poem or a short story. They go through uh, a process of vetting them one young person for the county is selected as a winner, and that winner works with a director, and they actually turn their story into a film. So prior to this year, we had a relationship with the national program, Scenarios USA. They went out of business, and we were able to form a consortium in Cuyahoga County and keep the program going because our young people, they have a lot to tell us, they have a lot to say, and the program gives them an opportunity to have that outlet. And I think that's one of the great things about the after-school program is that it's given our young people another voice where they can actually talk about what's happening to them and they can feel safe in an environment that's good for them. So our vendor for this is Starting Point. Um, we did issue an RFP for this contract. Uh, I think this is, will be the third year of the RFP. Um, and it's a public-private partnership where the county is the public side, but Starting Point also gets funding from the state of Ohio that supports out of school time, and they also receive funding from the Cleveland Foundation. So when you put all of those funding pots together, you get a pretty robust program in Cuyahoga County. We would love to expand it, but right now we're at the, um, the 29 sites plus the support to the SeaTac sites for the summer. Good. That's it. So any questions? I just want to clear... Um, point out that this is just an amendment. We're adding one more year to the yes. contract, and then at the next round, perhaps, we'll be going to get a longer-term contract. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and that might be 2021, next year, January. Yes. So we're having conversations because um, there's the issue of the public-private partnership, but then there's also the other issue that we do not have any vendor, other vendors in Cuyahoga County that are able to provide the management of this program besides starting point. So when we issued the last RFP, we had vendors show up, but they showed up because they thought we were moving to the same model that they use in early childhood for UPK, where we were going to RFP the vendors and then starting point would manage the contracts. And when they got there and realized that we were actually RFPing the management component, none of them were, were interested or able to facilitate that process because they're, not, they're designed as direct service agencies. Starting Point is designed as an umbrella agency, and that's what you need. And so Starting Point's been here since the beginning, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. So questions from committee? Councilwoman Brown? 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Through the Chair, how, how are we determining eligibility for um, this, the participants? Is it strictly the student school or a combination of both? A starting point actually issues an RFP. Okay. And um, they, they have a reviewers from um, United Way, the city of Cleveland, from all over. They come in and actually review the responses and they rank them and then they fund based on money. And they just go through the list until they run out of funds. And you said we have 29 schools that are participating? It's not schools, it's communities. Community. And so it's 21 consortiums in the city of Cleveland. And so in order to be eligible, a consortium has to be one or two, I mean two or three agencies in the community. So for example, if I offer um, an arts program and Councilman Jones does a basketball program and Councilwoman Simon does a literacy program, we come together as a consortium because we're all offering something different and we have a wider reach for kids. So there's 21 consortiums in Cleveland and nine in the suburban communities. Um, can you provide us the list? I don't expect you to list them all right oh, now. I have so, them, but okay. yes, I can. Okay, all right, if you'll get us the list. And then, um, it's, I wasn't clear, is this strictly summer or? It's year-round. Year-round. So some programs operate during the school year, and then some programs are summer programs. Okay, and then my last question is relative to the um, to the film uh, mm -hmm. project. You said there's a two-year process. Mm -hmm. So that's done within the consortium, too? It's, it's outside of the consortium. So that's that's so the contract, part of it is out of school time, and part of it is what we call transitions. And under the transitions component, that's where we look at the kindergarten clubs. So we look at transition points that kids have. So that's under the literacy umbrella of that. And in there, the reason it's two years, because there's one year to do the curriculum with the kids and have them actually write the poem and the short story. The second year is for them to do the filming, and then year three, they start over again with the um, the curriculum to do the poem or the short story. And then for year four, it's a film. Now, is that age and subject specific? And the reason I'm ask asking is because one of the things that I discussed with our staff is trying to incorporate some type of a creative platform for our youth to address how they could stop violence in the community using mm -hmm. an artistic outlet, whether it was uh, visual or... Um, verbal or oral, uh, whether it was a poem or, or you know, art. And mm -hmm. this sounds like it could be tied in relatively easily. So how, what is the subject that they, is there a, a specific? It varies. Okay, the subject matter varies. Mm -hmm. And is there, are there specific ages uh, yes. or age categories or? So the kids are 13 to 21. Okay. And um, they do, a, the, uh, the person who facilitates the process does a focus group with the young people prior to writing the curriculum to see what topic they want to discuss. So the topic this particular time is youth hopelessness. Mm. And, and all of the stories and poems that came in talked about a situation that they felt hopeless about. And so the young people actually picked the topics. And who evaluates or determines the winner, if you will? It's a whole group. Okay. She has a whole group of people that she sends stories to. We have, I know it's about 30 readers okay. that review the stories. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Councilman Jones. How, how many children were served over the, uh, the two year period? And how many, can you speculate on how many might be served in the amended additional year? We average about 3,100 just for out of school time. Um, we're taking a look this year to see if we can figure out what the transition number is. Okay. Because I would say it's probably equal to that. that. Um, and help me to visual, visualize uh, starting point is like the, the lead agency and the manager. Yes. Uh, so when the consortium, to use your example of those three entities that form a consortium, what uh, what are they leading, managing <laughs> okay. in terms of the consortium? So in terms of the consortium, they okay. are responsible for the contract. Okay. Um, they um, are kind of an intermediary between the county and the provider for paying the bills. So they, the individual bills come to them, and then they send us 
a packaged big bill. Um, they also do the quality component. Um, they do site visits to make sure that the sites are operational and doing what they're supposed to do. Um, they do troubleshooting for the sites. They manage all of the data that we give to CASE to do their evaluation, but you have to have a hub to collect it. So they collect the data. Um, they, they're gotcha. a parent agency to them. Gotcha. So I, I, I've, obviously I've seen the, uh, the relationship with, with CTAG. Mm -hmm. That's a little different or is that the exact same? Um, it's, it's very similar to what they're doing for the other agencies. It's just the CTAG, um, it's only three weeks. Three weeks, that's the summertime. Yeah, it's three weeks in the summer, whereas the relationship with other providers may be longer. It okay. may be for the entire summer or it may be for the entire school year. Got you. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Councilman Miller. Thank you, Madam. Madam Chair, Director, uh, are there 30 sites or 29 sites? You mentioned 20. 29. There are 29 um, consortiums, but then we also have the CTAC sites just for the three weeks in the summer. And for the CTAC sites, that's two, three, four, five, six, seven. But you, so had, you said you have 21 in the city of Cleveland and nine in the suburbs, so that's yes. 30. Oh, I'm sorry, yes. 30. It's, it's 30, okay. And uh, is the amount of funds the same as it was last year? Yes. And is the amount of sites the same? Yes. No, I, I, let, me, let me correct that. There is some additional funding in there over what it was last year because we did an amendment in the middle of the year last year to add some additional funding for training because they also... That's another component that's in there is professional development. We offer professional development to the sites so that they can stay up on what's going on with our young people and they can keep current. To me, it seems like 3,100 is only a fraction of the number of youth that could benefit from out-of-school time programs. Am I correct about that? Oh, absolutely. So, so let me just say this. We're out of school time in our county. Um, there are about 10,000 kids outside of this 3,100 that participate in programming. And that programming is either they get it through the city of Cleveland, through the recreation centers, they get it through United Way, or it's parent private pay. So this is just a small snapshot of kids that are above and beyond that number, that 10,000 number. Okay, thank you. Welcome. I have a question on, starting point also administers MyCom. Is this similar? I mean, how, what's the programming with MyCom? Um, some of these sites are MyCom sites, and Some they get their out-of-school time programming through this process. So they also receive money. Part of the consortium is the Cleveland Foundation, and so the, um, the public-private partnership is the Cleveland Foundation. Um, they cover the, the admin cost for doing the programming with the exception of one position that we fund that supports the data system. Um, and then the Cleveland Foundation funds for the MyCom kids. There are some things that we cannot use county dollars for, but they may want their kids to participate in. They would pay for that programming if it's above and beyond what we can fund. So just as an FYI, South Euclid became a MyCom community, and they had one of their first programming was around environment and um, those issues surrounding the, the rivers and streams. So it's really different, really creative ways to embrace the kids and what's mm -hmm. going on in the world. So it's really a valuable um, programming both. And this is funded exclusively with health and human service funds. So, you know, I guess every time we have a contract, we'll point that out. Considering yes. the levy is, um, can you know, we need to make sure that this this money is available to the kids because you know, with the violence idea is excellent. So, um, okay, any more? And what we allow communities to do was we allowed them to fill their gap. 
So they told us what was missing for the kids. So it may not, the programming is not cookie cutter. It doesn't look the same in every community. It is designed for what that community needs. So um, without any further questions, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so this actually is going um, into effect January, well, for the extension, this is pr a priority, right? It yes. looks like we're going to have to perhaps suspend the time. Yes, yes. if yes. possible. Yes. Yeah, because we're already into the new year. Okay. So I'll move that um, this re resolution 2019-0295 be moved out of committee to our full council meeting um, with a recommendation of passage under suspension. Second. Second. Okay. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, so this will be on the next council okay. agenda. Thank Thanks you. so much. You're Happy welcome. New Year. So the next item is our presentation. There's no um, legislation pending about this. This is a, just information for the committee to hear about Neela Park um, preservation and future plans um, for the East Cleveland site. So we have two presenters, or one. Good afternoon. Well, me right now, and then uh, Roy Alaric is going to follow up. With okay, come on up to the mic. All right, great. Thank you. Steve, right? Steve McQuillan, yes. Uh, thank you very much for uh, um, hosting me for this uh, presentation about Neela Park. And um, I guess I should start this presentation. <laughs> and while I'm doing that, I'd like to just introduce myself very briefly. I'm a preservation consultant who lived in Cleveland 20 years and Westlake, and then I, I now am in Ashland County. But I've had the privilege of working uh, at Neela Park as preservation consultant starting in 1988 and then working for about 20-some years for GE in their quest to get tax credits. And as part of that work, I uh, helped them develop a preservation management plan. So I'd like to just introduce you briefly to Neela Park because I think it's a facility that a lot of people don't um, know a lot about since it's off limits to the general public for the most part, and you have to have pass to get in, that kind of thing like that. But it's an interesting concept. I'd like to talk to you just briefly about its history, how it got developed, and how important it is, and then also about uh, the possible future of it and some ideas and suggestions. So Neela Park is in East Cleveland uh, along Noble Road. Uh, uh, south of Euclid Avenue on the bluff there. And I think Roy will talk to you a little bit more about what a magnificent feature, I'm sure a lot of you are aware of, that escarpment there and, and how many beautiful uh, areas are there. But this is an early aerial view of Neela Park, often described as American America's first industrial park. And a little bit about the history of it. Thomas Edison had a little association with it in that he is the, the inventor of the light bulb and got a patent in 1879, and they, uh, it formed eventually General Electric out of Thomson General Edison Electric Company, and they held exclusive rights to manufacture light bulbs, electric light bulbs in this country. However, around the turn of the century, that exclusive patent went away, and various competitor companies were formed to um, um, develop light bulbs and sell them. Um, and this group of individual lighting companies, a number of which were in Ohio and elsewhere in the Midwest, uh, formed a consortium, consortium excuse me, called National, the National Electric Lamp Company, to do not only combined research for the different companies, but as a means of competing against GE, which at that time had you know almost virtually all of the light bulb business. So National started up a meeting in the summers in an island on Lake Ontario known as Association Island. And, and they had lots of interactions with family and friends and that as part of that. And um, one of their partners in it, uh, National, was Brush Electric in Cleveland, one of the, at the time, one of the biggest light companies in the uh, 
uh, world by Charles F. Brush, the arc lamp and lighting in that. And their plant was on East 45th near uh, Superior. So that's where National was. In order to sort of escape that urban area and everything, and then also recall sort of the camaraderie and, and wonderful family associations they had uh, at the island on Lake Ontario, Terry and Tremaine picked out um, this site, which was an old um, uh, vineyard uh, in East Cleveland, which had not been, been developed that much, but was rapidly developing. Uh, I think, as I mentioned there, East Cleveland was home to the richest uh, man of all time, uh, or modern times anyway, John D. Rockefeller, and it was a very uh, bustling and growing uh, inner ring suburb of upper class and upper middle class housing stock, and it had excellent transit links to downtown as well. And what they picked was a ravine uh, area there and that escarpment that you could look over and see Lake area, and then the ravine formed by Nine Mile Creek, which was a beautiful area there too. So the principles there of the National uh, Burton Tremaine and Franklin S. Terry and then some of the other principles, they put together NELA and chose this location and they got a budget to build the facility. Now, um, I show that as like a little relief area. That's a... Uh, uh, Biltmore in uh, Asheville, North Carolina. Now, Terry and Tremaine um, had a big budget to do their uh, research and develop NELA because what they were doing was um, uh, actually um, getting money from GE to buy up other companies, their competitors, so it was sort of an antitrust thing. GE gave them a huge amount of money, and part of their idea was to form a really nice research center there that would be a national center for the lighting industry. And they hired an architect, um, um, Frank uh, Wallace, who was the chief architect of Biltmore for Richard Morris Hunt, who died during that construction of that, that was Richard Morris Hunt. And uh, they also summered uh, nearby there, uh, Terry and Tremaine, so they knew Wallace. And, and he developed essentially the what we call and how you exactly call that America's first industrial park, a park-like setting for research and manufacturing. The north end was for research and the south end was for manufacturing and manufacturing facilities. The way NELA worked is um, back in the days uh, was that the uh, working workers rode the streetcars, entered in at that building you see down at the lower end, the lodge, and um, went through a tunnel system to go to the factories at the south end. And, uh, and part of that's a subway system too. One of the beauties of Neela Park is it really sort of architecturally interesting is I show this old picture of this uh, the circular pool. Uh, every building at Neela Park had a n number on it, and that's was GE's doing. It the number refers to building 307 as the beginning of the numbering system, but the numbering system started out at GE's uh, headquarters uh, outside of Syracuse, New York, with building 100 and so on and so forth. But this pool was built for um, fighting fires and manufacturing, so it's a very deep pool and it's kept uh, free from ice by heat, artificial heating so, it, so it's at the top of the area and um, that formed the framework in the second wave of construction of one of the most beautiful buildings in the greater Cleveland area the um, Institute building, building 326 that was originally built as a cafeteria for Neela Park but is now uh, international center where GE brings in people to show the, them the latest in lighting technology and discuss with uh, other tech types. And that, see, the plan of it goes around the pond and embraces it, which was an interesting idea. And then it had the uh, beautiful um, sculptural figures, uh, which Cleveland's known for around different areas, uh, you know, the Federal Building and so on and so forth. But these were two of the city's greatest sculptors here on the top of the Institute, the triumph of light over darkness. And um, 
the, just to show you the typical buildings around the central quadrangle was the key to the uh, research and, and management campus. And you see that here. Um, the building at the top was the LDL building, or 321, 322, 323, three connected buildings, part of the first wave of construction. And then at the uh, south end, there is building 307, uh, engineering building. And then the one with the, the um, I guess maybe you can make that out as a telescope at the upper left, that uh, was the building reserved for Thomas Edison when he would come to Neela because what happened was as a, as a result of an antitrust settlement in 1911 that um, Neela was broken up and transferred over to GE, and GE agreed to make uh, East Cleveland the headquarters of its entire lighting operation and research center, which had previously been in Llewellyn Park, New Jersey. That was Edison's home at the time. So Cleveland gained a lot from that, and uh, there were a lot of national figures in finance that were associated with that whole enterprise. By the way, the, the front lawn is sort of legendary in that it's, it was mowed daily like a golf course putting green by GE. I imagine they probably still do that today, and only the managers were allowed to walk on the brick sidewalks with people. Otherwise, you know, the workers had to go on the tunnel system to go down. And it's a very private kind of uh, distinct uh, area there. It's kind of interesting about the history of that. Also with Neela Park is Neela Camp, a uh, uh, feature that recalled their days in the island in Lake Ontario. And that was a center for social activities. And there's still parts of Neela uh, Camp that survived today. And there were a lot of traditions that were there from years and years, even from when I was working there too. They would have camp days for luncheons and events and other things like that. Uh, for all the employees, and then they would have weekend events, like a lot of things did, but a lot of that, the activities, the swimming pool, the bowling alleys, other things are still there in part at least, but not like they once were. So anyway, and of course a lot of people from the greater Cleveland area know Neela Park for the Christmas lighting displays uh, that in the early days they had the park open, but Due to security and other factors, uh, it's mainly been along uh, Noble Road. Um, and then uh, also another part of the uh, legend of Neela Park is that Building 310 at the uh, far right was the uh, residence of Franklin Terry um, originally, and he had a full-time gardener and other uh, service staff and to uh, maintain it. And GE still maintains that to a high level, the whole uh, complex and facility, which is one of the things that really uh, marks that as a great uh, place. So we, um, Neela Park is listed on the National Register of Historic Places uh, as a nationally significant resource. But as I said, it's not too well known to a lot of people in Cleveland. But it's certainly a, a, um, a terrific resource, and it has great potential for the future. And that's what I want to spend just a few minutes talking about. And then um, we can also you know, discuss any questions you might have, too. Um, Neela Park is nationally significant. And there are other areas of the, um, there are other features of East Cleveland that are nationally significant, too. Uh, this uh, view is of uh, uh, Forest Hill, the estate of John D. Rockefeller, whom he uh, lived in for much of the time uh, until it burned in 1916, around the time of, a little shortly after his wife's death. And, uh, but he would come to Cleveland a lot as a, uh, uh, to have that park, and that's where his son, John D. Rockefeller Jr., got his start in development. He developed Rockefeller Center and also was a great philanthropist, uh, set up many parks and other things and in universities and other institutions across the country. But he got his start there in managing uh, that estate. And also, I'm sure some of you may be familiar with the uh, Rockefeller uh, subdivision there, which was uh, uh, also on the National Register 
um, built and developed by John D. Rockefeller. Very specialized, interesting Tudor revival homes and, and so on there that are very prized by their residents. Half of it's, I think, in East Cleveland, other parts in Cleveland, East, in Cleveland Heights, excuse me. Um, and the, although the main mansion doesn't stand there anymore, um, Forest Hill Park, the remnant of Rockefeller's estate has many significant uh, landscape features and is uh, also listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Um, so I want to talk, I mean, I'm mentioning these because these are features in East Cleveland that are close to Neela Park, and I think they combined kind of help make it a, a very significant facility. Um, now, um, Oh, I guess I left a, a slide I should have had when I revised it, but in any event, that's my fault. What I wanted to talk about, I had a whole thing there that I wanted to talk about national landmarks and national monuments to you because those are things that might be considered as, as the future moves ahead. Now, GE is still there, and they're still maintaining Neela Park, but the lighting business is up for sale, and as you may have read, parts of it have been sold off, and so the long-term future of this facility, there is some question about that. And I think that GE could be an excellent partner to work with on an overall plan that ensures this facility meets its maximum potential for um, the East Cleveland, Cleveland Heights community and the East Side and also for the region in a way because it is a, a national attraction. Now, and in discussing this with some of the members of the Sierra Club, we talked about, and I've been to Chicago a few times, and as I'm sure maybe some of you have been too, but one of the key things that I went to see was um, Pullman, which uh, President Obama designated as a national monument. By the way, the Antiquities Act of 1906 established, uh, enacted under President Theodore Roosevelt, set up a, the first program in the nation to designate sites and properties of national significance and that, that are done by executive action. Of course, that's one of the controversies to get in. One president designates something as a national monument by executive authority, which the law calls for, and then whether a future president can undo that. But a couple of things that, that President Obama did were the uh, working class uh, suburb uh, uh, for workers in the Pullman railroad car business uh, in the south side of Chicago, which were, had a distinctive architecture, all like Neela Park in a way, all designed by one architect, in that case S.S. Beeman, and which, which though unfortunately was very deteriorated and some of the buildings had burned and so when I've looked at this coming in back over the few years, I've seen the transformation. They have reconstructed, rehabbed um, a number of the buildings there, and it really is uh, coming together as an interesting focal point for the south side of Chicago. Now, national monument status brings with it federal funding and it has to be administered by the National Park Service. I think that would be a great goal to have for this, but it requires a um, political support, and it's, it's basically a national monument. It's basically a presidential decision. And, and well, whereas uh, um, a number of our recent presidents have designated a number of them, it does require that local action. Uh, I recall reading and, and something about Cuyahoga Valley National Park being set up that way back in the 70s and all the great support that came together for that. But what I think here is on a smaller scale anyway, linking, and we've talked about that at the Sierra Club, some of the great attractions on the east side. Neela Park has both architecture and nature through the Nine Mile Creek uh, Valley um, and uh, as a beautiful area that people don't really know that much about. Now, linking that through to Forest Hill Park and the Forest Hill Subdivision, the Lakeview Cemetery, which has the presidential tomb and, and Rockefeller's tomb, and also maybe to Euclid Creek Park and creating sort of a system that way that links together these nationally significant properties and I think could become a viable uh, future plan for this 
area and it could breathe a lot of life into it. Right now, um, GE, you know, Neela Parks, an active, and, and when I worked there, which has been a little over 10 years ago, they had students from East Cleveland through some of their joint partnership arrangements and things like that, community outreach. And um, they did work with the community, but most of the staff that are, are from outside the area, uh, or the immediate area anyway, but if there were some kind of uh, plan to work with GE on this, this could be uh, terrific in that you might see this becoming more open to the public and, and the uh, park resources that maybe something could be managed you know, by Metro Parks or some other organization that uh, some of the buildings might be adapted because a lot of the buildings are empty now, especially for manufacturing. It's not been done there for over the last 20 years. And some might be converted to apartments. I always talk to the people that I work with in building uh, 314. That was the old stables for Neela Park. It was built right at the cusp of you know, the automobile, and they had stables for horses and that, but they never used them because the automobile came in. And so a lot of littler buildings like that, and also some of the industrial buildings could be interesting that way. So there are a lot of things that might be some interesting ideas for how Neela Park could be reused. But I would say that it would be great to start with some kind of further investigation. And what I look to is the, the terrific role that Cuyahoga County government played in uh, Playhouse Square and other projects where they took a lead role in saving what has become a national resource, really, and developing that as a wonderful entertainment venue, which it is now. I mean, the county helped do that. Now, I, as a preservation consultant, had worked with the city of East Cleveland in helping them with some of their housing issues. This was about 10 years ago. Uh, they were doing a lot of housing demolition in the Forest Hill area. And in my looking over the buildings, there are a lot of wonderful residential properties there, but there's a lot that's also deteriorated, too. And, and la lack of investment, abandonment, all okay. that. You see all those things coming in there. And uh, this could help. It's not just Neela Park itself. It's that whole region that we're talking about with the reinvestment in Forest Hill Park, the cre creation of a wonderful link between them, utilizing some of the more recently vacant land through demolition and neglect, but also recognizing that as a stable area and, and stuff we, like we that. We only had a half hour, right, remember. Sure, I'm sorry. I'm, so I, I just I want to you. make sure you know because we have another speaker, I, that, right? Exactly. That's So right. you so, want to wrap it up? We yeah. Mm -hmm. This is my last slide, okay. so I'm wrapping it up now then. And... Uh, I'll leave it open to him, and then if any of you have any questions, then just let me know then. All right, thank you. Thank you. Roy? I want to save time for you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Good afternoon. everyone. Roy Larrick, a proud resident of Euclid and a uh, watershed uh, consultant a, uh, with Bluestone and also representing the Central Lake Erie Basin Watershed Collaborative, 20-some groups working together to improve watershed issues in our area. And <clears throat> I'm here today to talk very specifically about Neela Park as a concept in watershed conservation of Nine Mile Creek. And Nine Mile is... Nine Mile is then a, uh, the third largest stream uh, east of the Cuyahoga River. Euclid Creek is the largest one within the county, and then Doan Brook and Nine Mile Creek. And what that means is that Nine Mile Creek is not quite large enough to have been well preserved with either a Metro Parks uh, reservation or with uh, estate parks such as Rockefeller did with Doan Brook, Rockefeller and others. So Nine Mile has not much public land on it and it's been subject to development for more than a century. And what that means is that quite a bit of it has been put in pipes. And if you can see on this map, uh, just very vaguely, the uh, brown, the, the orangish lines are in pipes, the dark blue is out of pipes. And Neela, marked cursorily there with the name, 
um, sits at the foot of the Escarpment Ravine, which Steve talked about as being an area of great natural significance and also one of beauty as well. So today I want to talk about uh, four projects that are currently uh, part of the Nine Mile Creek watershed and that for the first time in 100 years are serving to make this watershed and the stream something better, okay? Much better than it has been in the past. So the first one I will speak of is the Langerdale Marsh, and that was uh, done in 2008 and 2009 and restored a wetland, a ravine wetland of about 10 acres. And it was a rather large project uh, conducted by the city of South Euclid and um, amounted to just under eight. $800,000 altogether. Once again, 10 acres that went from being a concrete retention basin now to being uh, something that has ecology connected with it and that has become a part of the community in South Euclid. Okay, the next one, also in South Euclid at the headwaters of Nine Mile Creek, but farther to the west, is Oakwood Greens, connected with the Oakwood Commons development. And this was 5.5 uh, acres of land set aside to uh, become a wetland, a stormwater retention basin, taking in part of the old Oakwood Club uh, golf course, uh, nine, nine greens of it. And uh, this is evolving over time. It's a $400,000 project, first interstate properties, and it's a very nice public place, and it keeps a lot of stormwater out of the regional storm system. And then uh, number three is way downstream at the mouth of Nine Mile Creek at Lake Erie. And that is uh, several acres <clears throat> now that are um, under restoration by the village of Bratnall with funding from Ohio EPA and the Regional Sewer District. This is a project of uh, about $750,000 restoring more than 1,000 feet of, um, of stream course there that has erosion problems and habitat problems. All right, so those are three projects, two at the headwaters, one way downstream that um, are contributing quite a bit of money and effort to taking Nine Mile Creek forward into the 21st century. And then the last one I'll talk about is a proposed project, not yet funded, but it involves then the Escarpment Ravine, and in particular, 39 acres of floodplain that remain undeveloped. If you can imagine the Euclid Creek Reservation without roads, without picnic areas, a similar kind of ravine in terms of height of, of the cliff, the width of the floodplain, just slightly smaller, but totally undeveloped for nearly 40 acres here. This has the possibility to really contribute to the health of the Nine Mile Creek watershed if we could then uh, restore the stream channel and the floodplain to some, to some extent. And I'll just ask you to notice there that uh, for more than a mile, for 7,500 linear feet, there is you know, a nice floodplain, forested, second growth, of course. Uh, but if you look at the stream channel, you can see that it's scoured, that the flooding, the urban flooding has really moved things downstream and you end up with a habitat that uh, is not as good as it could be. So the project that we have in mind would be to uh, to actually restore, once again, 7,500 linear feet, 39 acres of floodplain. It would be a kind of pricey project, but nevertheless, this would do well for the watershed and lead right in to the next, which is Neela Park itself. Roy, can I ask you a question? Yes. Who's we? Who, who's well, looking to we restore would be, this? Who's the we? The partners have not yet been determined, oh. but it would certainly be the city of South Euclid, a bit of the city of, it's in the city of uh, Cleveland Heights as well, so another partner there. Sewer District yeah, would but certainly who's be. who's we? Who's leading this? Is this Friends of Euclid Creek? What, or is it this you? This is Bluestone, right. This is Bluestone and this uh, Central Basin Watershed Collaborative. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And it's this is a project that we have defined, but it's uh, it's ready to go for funding. We have not sought the partners yet to do it. Okay. okay. Busy. I'll tell you, we've just been busy with that okay. restoration down at the mouth. Uh, okay. 
Well, this is a project um, in South Euclid that they're seeking just to start exploring partnership for that project. Right. Exactly. It's, it's only related, I think, to to the whole um, watershed and how everything connects. If do you, you want to know how much this project might cost, Councilwoman Stevens, for the. It's here. It's one point two five zero. That's right. This is the projected price right now. Right. In in twenty nineteen. Okay. Good. Basically. Okay. So, but we're going to move on to Neela Park. Yep. Which is New, move on to Neela Park. Okay. Even though everything's connected. And yes, and this sits right at the base of this escarpment ravine, and uh, nine. Excuse me. Neela Park is a large campus, but there are twenty six acres that sit in this escarpment ravine, and. Uh, the stream is not open at this point. The stream goes into a culvert where Belvoir Boulevard, you know, comes down from Princeton, goes into the valley, and it gets to the middle of the valley. There's a culvert from where Nine Mile Creek goes under Belvoir, almost all the way to Lake Erie. Okay, but uh, in to the side of Neela Park, that is to the north of it, uh, the. The campus has these 26 acres, and so the last slide I'll show then is then this uh, ravine as it looked from an artist's conception back in uh, 1920 or so. You see that there was to be a lake down there. Uh, that's really not feasible, but the pathways, the forested area, that's part of these 26 acres, which by now is quite overgrown. And once again, it is difficult for us to approach this through, let's say, Ohio EPA for funding or some of these other organizations that want to restore an open stream. This is not an open stream. Nevertheless, there is a lot of good habitat, forested land uh, that uh, supports a, a variety of plants and animals, a diverse ecology. It is also one of these areas that the sewer district looks at and says, you know, we could do something with this. They have plans they're going through with to daylight that is open up the street part of Dugway Brook that's in Forest Hill Park now to about a thousand feet in there. And so that is the kind of project that in the long term could be done here. So in conclusion, Nine Mile Creek is a watershed resource. It is 26 acres within this escarpment ravine where there are plans to restore the 39 acres or 7,000 linear feet of stream course above it. And this would be the next stage to really make something good of Nine Mile Creek. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, you know, there's no, I don't know who, to whom to ask this question about is GE looking to sell this property? Is GE looking to do something? Or is this just the groups hoping that something can happen other than development? Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, that, that's the question. And I think Sonny and Cheryl and the rest of the committee, I'm sorry, I don't know you as well. I think that's really the question that you can help the community with. For us to go as individuals and to try to contact, um, although there has been some contact, Kathy was um, successful. I think that Armin Budish did meet with Bill Lacey, the GE chairman. But I really think that's a, that's a question that you, and I'm sorry, Dale, I don't mean to leave you out. Mm -hmm. That's not fair, considering all your efforts. Um, anyway, it's really the government's quite, government has to help people with that. They're not going to answer. Fran Minch calls up, I'd like to talk to Bill. It's not going to happen. So I, I guess we're gonna, I'm going to volley that one right back to you, Sonny, and say that that's something for you and your committee and or Armin um, to find out for us. We need your help. If not, I don't know how many of you have driven by the observatory in East Cleveland on, on Taylor. Have any of you driven by there recently? Okay. Say it, Cheryl. <laughs> and that's what we're really worried about happening. So I volley it back to you, Sonny. Okay, thank you so much, you know, for bringing this to our attention, and, you know, we'll see what we can do to 
follow up with the executive's conversation he had. Kathy Schaefer, you're on. Did receive an exciting phone call one day when they said, you know, Armin Budish executive calling for Kathy Schaefer. They did go out there. It was very nice. He said, I think what they briefly said was there was seven bidders and everything's confidential, you know, and not much uh, information on who's trying to buy or what. But, yeah, would we, as Fran said, we would need some help with that. So, you know just trying to push. It's a really special place and very significant to the country. Thank you. Thank you for bringing this to our attention. I appreciate it. Okay. Any questions? Councilman Miller? Just a comment. I, I think the thing that uh, holds back Neela Park's future more than anything else is that most of it is closed to the public. And, and so I think there would, there would have to be uh, some kind of a plan developed so that at least part of it could be, uh, be readapted to some kind of public use so, so that there would be a public interest in it. And... and uh, uh, I'm not saying it has to be all of it, you know. It, it it could be some kind of a mix, but but some some kind of public use that could be a draw and and would uh, uh, get the interest of some people that might have the resources to help make it happen. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I think first we have to see what GE is interested in doing. Primarily, I just want, um, as final miscellaneous business, we have um, State Rep Kent Smith here uh, in the audience. Kent is um, our House Rep, um, and we have a Councilwoman from East Cleveland, Gowdy. Is that correct? When, yeah, I just wanted to welcome you to the meeting. Thanks for coming and being interested in this. Um, and we have a gentleman waving in the back. Is is there a comment? We're past public comment, so we can't. Okay. Okay, we'll have to. I don't know. Then come on up. Do you, do you want anything to add? To... You're from GE. Awesome. You work in the park. Okay, come to the mic. We're happy to have you. Hey, Can you give is, your name? Uh, Charles Robinson, the president of Local 84707, representing the union members at uh, Neela Park. Um, so far, we're not hearing anything about any bidders or anything, but we know the business is up for sale. They've sold the LED business to a um, investment firm called AIP, which is a little bit different than General Electric, but we're in the same location. Um, right now, the city of Cleveland has the STEM school up there right now, if you're not familiar, and building, uh, I can't think of the building number 330, but anyway, Cleveland has a STEM school up there, so yes, um, we're looking at the park to be utilized to its full potential, whether if it's sold, not sold, however it goes, because um, it's a beautiful place, and it's about now roughly about 600 employees. And I live in Cleveland Heights, also working in East Cleveland, so I understand the, the importance of the economical um, aspect of this whole thing. So if you guys could you know, really help us out or help me out, I'm right there and still not getting any answers from Big GE, so... You know, the minute we hear something, we the union, we try to take an action because we do represent members up there. So if you guys have any questions for me, I can try to answer them for you. If not, I can go sit back down. Yes, yeah, so if you can give our clerk um, your information sure. over here, call, Ashley, sure. uh, or our staff, so we have a contact, and we'll keep you in the loop. Yes, please. We're, 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 we're very invested in this also. Okay. Thanks so yeah, much. Yeah, I've been there 25 years, so yeah, I'm, I'm okay. very invested. So sorry for taking time. No, I'm so glad. Yes, perfect. Okay, thanks so much. Thank you. All right. Appreciate it. Okay, we'll keep an eye on this and hopefully have something similar to the, um, you know, Metro Parks and Lyndhurst over at the park. You know, at least that was a success. It's up to GE what, you know, what they want to do. And then we need to get um, partners in place to see if we can fulfill what they would be able or willing to do to restore and maintain that property. But um, thanks so much, everybody. We are going to adjourn. <laughs>